All right, again, welcome everybody to the CFA IWS, which is the Christian Fire Assembly Eyewitness School. And tonight, um, I might challenge you all a little bit. We've been talking about being a witness for the Lord for, I guess, several years now to get certain things understood. But before I go any further, Father God, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that we can gather in this format, come together uh, through an electronic medium, uh, allows us to see each other, allows us to see the scriptures together, allows us to be able to communicate with each other, and allows us in this very moment to pray with each other. So I ask, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that this would be a very fruitful time for us to be in the scriptures together a challenging time for us to exercise our spirit. And I ask, Father, that you would forgive us of any kind of sin or transgression, iniquity, or wicked thing, whatever it is, whatever kind of omission that we may be guilty of or commission that we may be guilty of, whatever the matter. I thank you for the blood of Jesus because I ask you to cleanse us now. Let us, Father God, be cleansed to stand in a place of righteousness so that our spirit can hear what the spirit is saying, what your spirit is saying to us now, what your spirit will say through each one of us to each other to build the body together. So for that, Father God, we thank you for giving us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you tonight to go into the word and be challenged and Father, we're ready to do the exploits, but I know we still need to continue to mature. So I thank you for every little bit of maturity that we experience just by iron sharpening iron and being in the word and, and looking to be used by you at any moment, in any place, at any time. So we thank you, Father God, for that as we desire to move forward in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody that agree with that prayer can say amen. 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 All right. So um, this is the uh, eyewitness school, which means that we're going to always, on the second and the fourth Tuesday night, uh, look at things that pertain to us being strengthened and being able to minister to people, being a good witness, understanding what we're saying and being challenged and what we're doing. And on the first, third, and fifth Tuesday, that's always going to be an open forum Bible study. And on those, I think I have mentioned that we want to begin to take a deeper dive into looking at healing and looking at what that is really all about. But tonight, it's about strengthening our ability to witness. Because why, <laughs> why be a Christian if we're going to keep it a secret? <laughs> so <laughs> we really do need to be about the Father's business, especially in the day that we are in. So uh, you ready to go to the Word? Ready. Yes. All right. Well, let's, let's go. Okay, we're going to we're going to look at something that maybe we've looked at very briefly in the past, but uh, I want to take more time to open this up. As you can see, I'm in the 4th chapter, if you're looking at my software. I'm in the 4th chapter of Luke. And this is immediately after uh the Lord is baptized and there's uh you know what's interesting? I'm going to back up here a little bit. Uh, this is the the lineage that he comes from. But I'm going to back up here to the 15th verse. And this is this is John the Baptist that's um, speaking to the crowd of people that came out to be baptized, of which they're joined by the Lord Jesus himself. So in verse 15 it says, And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, whose latchet, who, whose latchet 
uh, shoes. I am not worthy to unloose. I know that's a little transposed what I said. Whose latchet, <laughs> the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This is out of John's mouth. This is what's supposed to happen. And so he's letting people know that I am not the one. I am not the Messiah. But I'm going to tell you about him because he's the one that's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The scripture says, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner. But the chaff will he burn with fire unquenchable and many other things. In his exhortation, preached he unto the people. Uh, verse 19. Let me raise this up a little bit. <clears throat> verse 19, it says, But Herod the Tatriarch being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Now, what's funny, I'm going to keep going here, but <clears throat> here's John. You know how there's this expression that we'll use that goes, speaking truth to power? You know, we may be using that term when we want to talk about our government, politicians, administrators in some high-powered place, and we'll say we want to speak truth to power because we're going to say something from the heart to, to them, to whoever it is that's running things. Well, John did that. John spoke truth to power. It landed him in prison, and ultimately it cost him his head. But yet, here's a man of God that was not necessarily phased by government power and structure and superiority, if that exists. He would still bring a truth to the immorality of those that were in leadership. And, uh, of course, they took issue with him when he did it. But I just wanted to mention that in passing. But in verse 21, it says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Now, I just want us to see that the Lord modeled something there. We've been on Sundays, uh, been talking about being born again and talking about the kingdom of God and talking about in that conversation what John in the third chapter had written about the conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus, of which Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he re reiterated this, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, he modeled that. This is him modeling that. He went to get baptized. And, of course, baptism has to deal with water. So he went to be baptized uh, because it had to be done to fulfill all righteousness, as it is said in the book of Matthew. When John said, why are you coming to me to be baptized? And then Jesus' answer was, uh, it has to be done uh, to fulfill all righteousness. So we, looking at his example, he's given us the example. He's baptized, and the Holy Spirit came upon him as he was praying. <laughs> the scripture says as he's praying, the heaven was open, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove. And was there any supernatural talking on that day? Yes. It says the dove, bodily shape, like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven. Whenever the tongues were engaged, the Bible says there was the, there was the uh, infilling of the Holy Ghost 
uh, those tongues landed upon everyone, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And here's Jesus. The Holy Ghost descends upon him, and then there's a voice from heaven. When we're speaking in tongues, it may be our it may be our literal vocal cords, voice, box, all of that. But the inspiration of that is coming from heaven for a heavenly language. Uh, that's that prayer that's coming out. But this is being modeled here. It's very clever. <laughs> I, I have come to the understanding that God is very clever. So it's very clever how he does this. But if you're looking, he'll show it to you that when anybody says, well, are there any languages that came from heaven on that day? Yeah, it was. It was Jesus and a voice from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. So when we are baptized in the spirit, the first thing that God is going to do, which could be a very lengthy Bible study, but the first thing that he's going to do when you're baptized in power, he's going to grab a hold of your tongue. That's one of the first things he wants to do is to cause your tongue to come into a place of being sanctified or being set apart for his use, which is why once we're filled with the Holy Ghost and we're speaking in those heavenly languages, the heavenly tongues, you've got to abandon all filthy communication because now God has set you apart for his use. The things that come out of your mouth from that point on need to be things that are wholesome, need to be things that are empowered by grace. And so one thing that God may do for people like myself, what happened with me is that when I got filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues, prior to that, I had a problem controlling the profanity. And then after that, I have not said one word of profanity in 40 something years <laughs> so Amen. and i'm telling you it was the it was the delivering power of the lord that did that the day that i spoke in those ridiculous sounding tongues but that tongue empowered my spirit and my spirit said no more profanity and there was no more profanity so anyway i just wanted to lay that out because the lord models everything for us so after this uh the bible talks about in verse uh 23 it begins talking about his lineage we came from the son of joseph the son of heli the son of Methath, the son of levi all the way down to the end of this chapter where we see in verse 37 which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Meliel, which was the son of Cana, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. And this is what God has been looking for from the beginning. He's been looking for sons. Now, I know we're male and female, but in the spirit, in our inner man, we're Amen. sons. We're sons of God. So now, uh, any thoughts before I go into chapter four? Anything you want to reflect on? Any observations? Any questions? Um, let's hear them. All is well. All is well. That's good to hear. <laughs> Anyone else? I mean, any, if there's no one else, I'll keep reading. What well, is amazing how James speaks about the tongue has the weakest part on the body that a man cannot control. And yet when the Holy Ghost came, that's, that's what it, it jumped on. It jumped on the tongue of man. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. The really unmember of our, uh, the, the unruly member of our body. Yes. <laughs> We don't want to remember the tongue. <laughs> All right. Yes, the the unruly member of our body, the tongue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I was thinking about uh, when I worked, how um, 
the Lord was saying that uh, if you want to have peace, keep your tongue quiet and don't entertain the foolishness of a kid because you'll get yourself all tangled and tangled in that foolishness. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Speaks about that the same it speaks about a drunk too. Don't entertain a drunk because the same thing will happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I give a quick testimony about a drunk? Uh, I think I think Way was Way my brother Mac was out uh, ministering and uh they ran into this guy that was drunk. And they would, they would try to minister to him. So what happened was they started praying um, and he stopped the foolishness and heard the word. So he they uh, he was no longer drunk. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I'll go ahead and throw my little drunk story in there too. <laughs> when I was very new to all of this uh, kingdom of God, power and you know I, I just wanted to go out and and touch the world and and just see what happens so one day I was with uh, Bishop Brock I think he's passed on now but his son, son is still uh, in ministry there in um, Tacoma Park but anyway he, he and I were walking down the street in DC and there was this this uh, guy uh, who was homeless and uh, <clears throat> he just looked like he was in very bad shape and he was drunk so you know under normal circumstances we probably just walk right by him but I noticed him and I said uh, Bishop Brock uh, hold on one second and um, I, I, the guy started talking, and his language was very, very slurred, and he was very disoriented. And uh, I cannot remember the exact words that I said to him, but it was something like, um, "Hey, brother, would you would you like for the Lord to do something for you?" And uh, he kind of slurred out whatever he was saying, but it amounted to. Yeah, if, you know, if, yeah, if he would, something like that. <clears throat> and so I looked at him, and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command the alcoholic spirits that are on this man to get out, and I command them not to reenter. And when I said that, he looked at me real strange, and then he started saying, I can see him. I can see him. <laughs> so I said, well, you can see who? He said, I can see them, them, them spirits. I can see them. So I said, again, I repeated it, and I commanded them to go and leave him alone. And when they left, within moments, his, he straightened up, and he said, and I said, brother, what's your name? He said, my name is Joseph. And then I said, Joseph, can you understand me clearly? And then he went from a slurred language to, yes, I can. <laughs> he started speaking so alert. He brightened up. And I said, and I said, uh, so you feel that you've been freed for something? He said, yes, as a matter of fact. And they started talking very lucidly. I mean, very, um, uh, very clearly understood in everything that he said. And what he said was, what have I been doing? What have I been doing with my life? It's like, I've just allowed the devil to run my life. What have I been doing? I, I, I used to be walking with the Lord. I used to be a Christian. As a matter of fact, I went to Jerusalem and I went to Jerusalem to be baptized in Jordan and I got baptized in Jordan. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> so we just stopped and we ministered to him for a minute. And then uh, when we were done, he was he was perfectly sober. Perfectly mm -hmm. sober. So um, mm -hmm. I pray that Joseph's still doing well to this day, but uh, we spent some time just ministering to him. But that's my drunk story. 
Amen. All right. Uh, any other thoughts before I go on? Because I'm about to go into Luke chapter 4. But if there's somebody that would like to say something right now, um, go ahead. And if not, we'll go ahead. All right. So this is the fourth chapter of Luke. Now, Jesus went into the went into the wilderness, as we can see here in verse 1, and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. So we are familiar with this, and I'm not going to uh, really unpack all that's going on here, <clears throat> but... Uh, I want to drop down because after he sent the devil packing, the scripture says a few very interesting things about about Jesus. And um, the scripture says that he went into Capernaum. And before I even get there, I want to back up to this. Verse 14. <clears throat> And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Everything that we're looking at is a paper trail. It's like a record of what he did because, again, he is modeling for us what it's like to be a son of God, what it's like Amen. to be a son of God. So, he uh, returned in the power of the Spirit. The Bible says in verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and, look at this, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the read. He was in, for all intents and purposes, folks, he was in church. He wasn't like, he wasn't like dismissing the um, company of other people. He was around other people. He went into the synagogue, which would be the equivalent of going into a church gathering or a service or meeting. And it was his custom. That's why I've got it highlighted. And he went in and he stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet uh, Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. This is where I want to hunker down a little bit and just talk. He went in, he went into a church service, and he was reading the Bible. We should be going into church services with the Word of God. <laughs> it should be part of what we carry. I don't care if you carry it in electronic format. As you can see, whenever I'm ministering, I've got the computer, I've got the iPad, I've got my phone. So I'm not a stickler for, you got to walk in with a, a, a paper Bible. No, just come in knowing that you've got access to the Word of God. <clears throat> so the scripture goes on and it says, There was delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, okay, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And then everybody just looked at him when he read that. Now he's reading something knowing full well that he's about to demonstrate what he read. He's about to actually show the reality of what he read is to be something that is not just to be talked about, but to be experienced. But Amen. 
in, in verse 20, it says, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and all eyes and all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, this day, this day. It's like he's not going to wait any longer to wait for something else before there's the fulfillment of this scripture. So having read this, give me some thoughts about what we just read here. Knowing Jesus just came out of the wilderness um, and he goes into the synagogue, he reads, and then he explains that this is fulfilled today. And the content, the content of what he read, I want to pay particular attention to that in a moment. But if there's anybody that wants to say something about what we just read, please do. Okay, I want to say something. Comma. Okay, um, let's go with uh, <laughs> Sylvia and then Lewis. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say, um, before I got saved, I was the agent of a lot of things. And then when I got saved, I realized that uh, what you just read in, in Isaiah, that Jesus was in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, and I was just saying that he stopped in a comma. He didn't finish reading the whole text because I think if he would have said this day, everything is being fulfilled before your eyes or whatever, uh, the rest of that text would have probably scared everybody out of that church. <laughs> that, it was very powerful. It was after that comma, there's a lot of power was coming. Um, well, interesting that you would say that. Um, do you know the words that come right after that? Yeah, it's basically the wrath of God. Um, can't remember all the words, but yeah, it's uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's not good for them for whoever's going to hear them. Right. Um, let me see here. I I believe that. Let me see. This is. Uh, oh, okay. I want to get to that in one moment, but the Lord spoke to me about this very very specific passage. And uh, when it's talking about the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, that comes out of Isaiah, I believe that's Isaiah 60, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Isaiah 61. And uh, let's see here. Isaiah 60 talks about the glory of the Lord is going to rise upon us. But Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Matter of fact, let's go here. Isaiah, Isaiah 61. Yeah. Here it is. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And what I've got highlighted here in big letters, and the day of vengeance of our God. And the Lord woke me up. It was kind of like... Um, well, let me just say this. He woke me up, and I heard him saying to me, I'm going to fulfill the rest of that passage. Because that passage, I woke up, and I had that passage in my head. I, was, I could hear it. And then the next thing that I heard was, and the day of vengeance of our God. And he was saying, I'm about to fulfill that. So we're really close to something. <laughs> really close to something. So you're right. Yes. Vengeance of our God. Yeah. That's uh, that's going to be something. Yes. Right. Yeah. Basically, like I said, I think, and, I, and I'm pretty sure because, you know, we are appointed to tribulation. 
but we're not appointed unto the wrath of God. And I'm almost thinking this is going to be part of the wrath of God. Yeah, I'm, we just, are, I'm just saying that out because I've, I felt that very strong before in that verse. Amen. Amen. Who else has got some observations, comments, thoughts, questions? I, um, I think I do. <laughs> mm. uh, this is more along the lines of when you were saying that um, Jesus was modeling for us. Yes. Um, who and what we are. Um, years yes. ago, we were somewhere and William was, was there and the question came up, who are you in the Lord? And, and what is the Lord calling you to do? And I didn't have an answer at that time. So I went home and um, got before the Lord and said, you know, what am I supposed to do? And uh, the next day, I was home alone. I, was, I don't know why I wasn't at work. And um, the Lord gave me a song. And um, bear with me. The song was this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he's anointed you to preach good tidings, heal the brokenhearted, proclaiming liberty, setting the captive free, to bring beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for spirits of heaviness. That they be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that Almighty God might be glorified. And Amen. Hey, uh, I think I remember Amen. that song. <laughs> yes. And yeah, he, me too. And he said um, to me to um, sing this song of blessing um, over others. That this was, I, I believe that this is, was the Lord's example of who I am. Um, it says in John 17 that um, he and us and us and him. And I, I know that I'm not the fullness of that, but it is very, I'm very sure that this was the Lord's example for me of who I'm called to be. And he said, um, when given an opportunity, and you know, I didn't want to sing this song, <laughs> but he said, this is your opportunity to um, sing the anointing of the Lord over those in this, in these words. And so I anoint you all in the name of Jesus for every heart that heard the words of this song, that it is, um, it is the Lord's blessing and calling over you. Mm -hmm. So be it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Wow. Well, thank you for uh, having the courage to do that, Nina, because I know you don't particularly feel comfortable doing that. <laughs> but it's we good. receive it. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, any other thoughts? All right. Well, this is what I'm going to ask you all. We're now looking at, we're going to look at a very specific thing. Remember I said I wanted to go back into this verse and unpack it a little. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. And just to be clear, when I say the Lord is modeling things for us, look at this. Luke 6. 40. The Bible says this, the disciple is not above his master. This is Luke 6, 40. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. So none of us are above the Lord, but he said, this is his statement to us. Everyone that is perfect, and perfect means growing and maturing in the love of God. 
allowing that love to completely transform and change us. That's what the perfection is all about. It's not about an intellectual excellence and, and the other thing that people think about in perfection, that you're so perfect you never make a mistake. No, no. This is about maturing in the love of God and Amen. growing because of that love to carry the character and the power of the Lord. So everyone that is perfected will be as his master. That's why Jesus appointed the 12 and told them to do what he did. Then he appointed the 70 or 72, if you like, and told them to do what he did. Then when we get to Mark chapter 16, he says, every believer is going to do what I did. So he's modeling, but I want to come back to this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me. Now, here's the word I want to I want to dissect a little. Uh, but I'm first going to ask you all, when you hear anointed or anointing or, I don't know, some people, some people even say anointment, but that's not a word. <laughs> but when you hear uh, anointed, what goes through your mind? What does anointed mean to you relationship with god it's like a special to me it's like a god's given us a special permission like you you have been selected you are anointed for this it's a special permission and you know it it's in the old testament i look at I'm oh, sorry. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. I didn't even know I was speaking out loud. I thought I was on mute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but anyway, what I was thinking about the priests in the Old Testament, how they were anointed, their ephod, everything, all of the oil, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe that's the anointing in the New Testament for us, that we're anointed with that same oil, that that Holy Spirit, I I don't know. That's no, what I was comparing it with. Nobody has said anything wrong here. I just mm -hmm. want to know when you hear that word, what are the thoughts that come to mind when you hear that word? Power of God. Well, I think one, one <laughs> thing is that God has given us the ability to do. Let me put it this way: the choice that He has. A sign for us by strength, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, the ability to do what does save the Lord. Okay. I well, guess the word I had was empowerment. Go ahead, Denise. Yeah. Yeah, and that, the word I get is empowerment. Okay. Um, I guess fall in line with what other everybody else was saying too. What I think about is the uh the presence of God and the full weight of what he, he brings with that. So I, I think of an anointing in um, God's presence, the power, the authority, the grace to do whatever in that moment that is there. That's really good. <laughs> Nobody has said anything wrong. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's all it's all true, it's all mm -hmm. true. Uh, as a matter of fact, if there's somebody else that wanted to maybe share their thought before I go into this, I was thinking of being um, consecrated or dedicated to God. Um, you look at those the high priests that were chosen from among the descendants of Aaron, I mean, they were just set apart and there was a, a thing that had to be done, you know, with their garments being dripping with oil and, and all. They they were never, they didn't touch the congregation. They didn't touch others. They were completely, not shut out, but they were just set apart. They were totally dedicated to God. And because of that, their, what they, their lives 
were all about God and then receiving what God is giving to them and giving it to the people and guiding them and directing them and teaching them. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. It came to me that, uh, um, that that anointing is like a covering of God's mm -hmm. glory on us. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Holiness. Holiness. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's the, I, when I see, especially in this verse, um, the anointing of the Lord is upon me. It's like the ability of Jesus himself <laughs> mm -hmm. is, a, is, is on and present to do whatever needs to be done or whatever he wants mm -hmm. to be done in that moment. <laughs> So is it fair to say that if you're anointed, you're supposed to do something with that anointing? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> All right. Does anybody know, <laughs> this is extra credit, <laughs> but does anybody know what three groups were anointed? And I'm speaking primarily in the Old Testament. What three groups were anointed? If you don't know, that's fine. I'll tell you. But if somebody's got that, uh, you could just step mm -hmm. on out there. The well, Levites. The priests were mm -hmm. the priest were on. Right. Okay, yeah. I heard Levites Definitely. and the priests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who else? And Judah, the praisers. Mm hmm Prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest. Well, Emily nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Say All it right. again. Go ahead, Emily. You can share that. Prophet, priest, and king. Thank you, Emily. I was going to say the same thing. I'm, I witnessed that. <laughs> Yes. Those were the three groups. The kings yes. were anointed. They were the anointed. The prophets were anointed. Yes. And the priests were priests anointed. Were anointed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, in the New Testament, you're anointed and you carry a royal anointing. You carry a prophetic anointing. You carry a priestly anointing. And just for good measure, uh, Jesus is the anointed one. Mm -hmm. When the anointing oil was made, I've got here in this note, is a special combination of spices mixed into the olive oil to create the oil for smearing, rubbing, and pouring. So it was smeared on, it was poured mm -hmm. on, it was rubbed in. But that anointing was a representation of the presence of God. So everything that you all were saying is right, okay? All of it's right. And here's the Lord saying, um, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. And each one of us, from the least to the greatest, if I can say it that way, should understand we are all anointed. And this anointing that we carry is extremely powerful. It's just a matter of, will we get out of the way of unbelief? Will we get the unbelief, the doubt, and the fear out of the way to allow the anointing to be seen in us? And it does take some action to begin to, let's say, initiate the flow of that anointing. Because if you never do nothing, if you just sit back and as much as we need to come together on a Sunday and hear a word ministered, as much as we need that, if that is all that we're doing, we are not allowing the anointing to do anything in us. 
We can hear, as a matter of fact, we'll come in and we'll hear music and we'll say, oh, that's really anointed. Oh, whoever sang this morning was really anointed. That choir was really anointed. Or the preacher was really anointed. And sometimes I wonder, do we know really what we're talking about? <laughs> but, uh, but there is a real presence of God that is associated with this anointing. And let me say this. Uh, let's just go here. Um, <clears throat> to, seen this before? This is First John, chapter two, verse twenty-seven. It says, "But the anointing which you have received." Hmm. The anointing which you have received. Mm -hmm. hmm. Anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, <clears throat> Everyone, I believe, is included in this statement. Is mm -hmm. there anybody that is in the Lord that is not included in this statement? Yeah. Oh. Once you receive the Holy Ghost. So literally everyone. Yeah. And the scripture says... Uh, the anointing which you have received, not the anointing which you shall receive. No, you have it. You have it. As I've been stressing over the last few weeks, it's already in you. It's in you. And what can it do in you? Well, it can teach you. Well, what's it going to teach you? Well, it's going to teach you the word, of course, but it's also going to teach you how to move with God, how to move with him, how to walk with him, how to put yourself out there and pray for somebody because of him. He's going to teach you. He's, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> if I come back here and I see something else that John said in one of his gospels, John says, this, he says, uh, how be it when the spirit of truth <clears throat> is come, he will guide you into mm -hmm. all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come, and he shall glorify me, and shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And this is to who? This is to everyone that has his spirit. This mm -hmm. is everyone that is anointed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, any further thoughts on this uh, before I go back in the, to Luke? How about John 14, which speaks of the Holy Ghost, which is the comforter, which the Lord was sent in his name. He will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Oh, let's see here, Sylvia. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <clears throat> 26. Uh, these things I have spoken to you, yet being present with you, but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father was sent in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. There is an absolute, there's an absolute uh, statement from the Lord that he is going to be teaching us. And you know what this reflects back to, folks? You know what all of this really reflects back to? It comes back here to this. 
this right here. Um, of whom we have many things to say and yet hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when the time you ought to be teachers. Wow, should we have been teachers? Should everybody have gone through some kind of teaching program? Well, if the Holy Ghost is in you, he's teaching you if you're letting, right? Mm -hmm. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth unto them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So what I'm saying is, I'm looking at this in Hebrews. I'm looking at this that we just read in uh in John 14, and then in John 16, and then in 1 John chapter 2, <laughs> there's no getting around that God has put something in us and we should be growing because of the anointing. Mm -hmm. You're right with me? Amen. Amen. So then I come back here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. And this anointing that's in you is going to allow you to do what he did. You'll do everything he did with the exception of dying for the sins of humanity on a cross for all of mankind. You will not do that. But everything that he did as he was walking the earth, that was an example. Remember, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. <clears throat> we should be able to do that. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. We should be able to do that. Healing is in this. Preach deliverance to the captives. Healing and deliverance are both mentioned here. Recovering of sight to the blind. Yeah, we're even empowered because of the anointing to see blind people have their sight restored and set at liberty them that are bruised. The most banged up, hurt people, the most abused or disabused people, we're able to bring a healing presence of the Lord and set them free and set them at liberty. And then in addition to that, to preach <clears throat> the acceptable year of the Lord and even begin to understand the part that we don't have here and the year of vengeance of our God. So we are anointed. He's purposed to show us what it was like for the anointing to be on him. He's purposed to show us that at his baptism, while he was praying, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove because the Holy Spirit didn't need to come upon him like fire, like it has to come on us because we're dealing with a lot of stuff. But <clears throat> the Spirit could come upon him as a dove because he's already submitted to his Father. <clears throat> but yet we still see the example of the Spirit coming upon him, of a supernatural voice from heaven speaking at that baptism, and the heavens were opened. Mm. You, <clears throat> being a new creature, have the heavens opened for you. It's just a matter of continuing to go deeper into your relationship <laughs> with the Lord. I just wanted to add that part where it says give sight to the blind. Not just physical, but, you know, it's also spiritual. You know, people can be blind to <laughs> revelation and understanding of the word. And the Lord has anointed us to be able to open up the blindness that people have to be able to really see God, to see the word, to understand his word. Amen. <clears throat> 
Amen. And if anybody's wondering if that is really scriptural, then just remember this. Um, <clears throat> remember this, but verse, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So there it is in scripture. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Well, is, is there anything else anybody would like to say? So I'm going to go ahead and, and and park right here. I mean, come back to this and park Pastor, here. But. Pastor, could you uh, elaborate a little bit more on John 14, 12? Uh, because, you know, we are supposed to we are supposed to be anointed. Because John 14, 12 tells us, you know, because you said, the things that I do, you will do even greater things mm -hmm. you will do. Can you elaborate on what does he actually mean even greater? Because, you know, uh, to me, I've always said back then when he was saying this, Holy Spirit had not been imparted to anybody. You know, only to a lot of his disciples, he, he was, they were doing things by his permission, by his word. But the Holy Spirit was really not imparted. But then again, once he went and, and now we got Father, Son and Holy Spirit living in us. Now that's three. That's four against the devil. If we can't win, we got an issue. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you what it's not saying, which some religious folk wanted to say. <laughs> he says, "Greater works than these shall you do." And, and again, whenever you see the verily follow with another verily. It means really pay attention to what I'm about to say. <laughs> this is very important. Verily, very I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do. What kind of works did he do? Everybody knows Amen. the works that he did. Healing. What's Healing. that? Raising the dead. Yes. All of those. Now, you know what religious folk today will make that say? The works that I do, shall he do also in greater works? Oh, uh, Jesus meant that when they were around in ancient times and they had to go and pray for people to be healed, that we're not going to do that anymore because now we've got so many doctors and hospitals that those are the greater <laughs> works, and there's going to be so many more people that will go into these hospitals, just so many more. That's what he's talking about. And, of course, that is laughable. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That is not what it's talking about. It is specifically referring to the things that he did, the works that he did. As a matter of fact, at one point, I think it's in the sixth chapter of John, he said, if you don't believe me, believe, if you don't believe that I came from the Father, believe me for the very works sake. Because That's the right. works testify that I came from the Father. So every time he refers to the works, He's not talking about what things that can be done naturally. He's mm -hmm. talking about things that will be done supernaturally. Mm -hmm. Again, Amen. He says, greater work. So what does that mean? It means, this is what I believe it means. I believe it means that going back to that same old example of going into a hospital, there may be a day where the Lord says, I've had you praying over people and you've seen them, you've seen them healed. But today, I want you to go into the emergency ward and before you can even get there, before you can even touch people, they're going to fall out in the Holy Ghost and they're going to come back to consciousness mm -hmm. 
totally healed every single one of them. That would be a greater work. Because Peter began doing a greater work than what Jesus did, looking at the shadow, just the shadow. Yeah, yeah. When it touched somebody, they were healed. And I think the scripture says that all of them, everyone that had that shadow come on them, they were all healed. And I'm looking at in this latter time, the latter days, the greater glory, the greater glory that will be on the church. We will do things like what Peter did and maybe even more uh, profound, maybe even more profound. There will be things that we will do that you don't necessarily see in Scripture, but it's not fighting against Scripture. It's not in conflict with Scripture. One of the things that we're supposed to mature in, we're supposed to mature in understanding the ways of God and that one of the things that we should notice is that even though God, uh, through the, the ministry of the apostles or through the life of Jesus, healed people, hands were laid on them or whatever, there may be ways that God heals differently, but it's still healing because he just wants to do it differently. You know, Jesus spits on the ground, takes mud, put it on a guy's eyes. Why did he do that? Because he just wanted to do it differently. <laughs> so we don't necessarily have to create a doctrine. It's the doctrine of the spit in the mud. We don't, mess, we don't need to create no doctrine off of that. Just if the Holy Ghost is teaching us, the Holy Ghost begins to teach us the ways of God. Then we'll begin to understand that, oh, uh, the Lord is leading me to do something I didn't necessarily see in Scripture. He's, he's telling me that what I need to do is just go stand on the property of uh, this, uh, this uh, neighborhood. Just go stand on the property. And I ain't never seen him do that, but he just said, go do it. Go stand on it and watch what happens. <laughs> and the anointing goes through the grass of everybody's lawn and hits the house and everybody in the house has a come to Jesus moment. Okay. It's just different. <laughs> so anyway, so greater works, greater works that are probably blow our minds. Yes. That I think makes a good sense. example is when Jesus sent the 70 out they, they didn't have the Holy Ghost, but because Jesus was with them, the Holy Ghost was with them because of Jesus being with them. And he ordered them to go out. And they went out and healed people. They, they did all kind of miracles. And they came back bragging about it. So Jesus had to sort of rebuke them for it. Mm -hmm. Well, they went out. And here's where that word we looked at a little earlier comes into play. They went out operating under his anointing. His anointing, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how they were able to do what they did. But that anointing will soon be deposited in them mm -hmm. when the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. came. Mm -hmm. The day of Pentecost. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the thing. Okay, folks. Any anything else? all right well would someone like to close us out in an anointed prayer yeah Heavenly father thank you lord god we thank you for this time that you have blessed us with, Lord God, to hear your word, to learn more of your word, Lord God, to sharpen one another, Father. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, and we bless you, Lord God. And, Father God, I pray, Lord God, as each and every one of us that have heard your word tonight, Lord God, that, Lord God, we dive deeper into it, Lord God, that we yes. become more and more of what you have called us to be, anointed, Lord God, 
Let your anointing fall on each and every one of us, Lord. Yes. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we bless you, Father God. And until we meet one another again, Lord, I pray, Lord God, a blessing over each and every one of my brothers and sisters. Thank you. I thank you, Lord, and we bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Let healing go forward for everyone that is on the Zoom call. If they came in to this call with any kind of a pain, any kind of discomfort, in the name of Jesus, we command the pain to go. And Amen. we thank you for the anointing and the authority to do that. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, for being on tonight. God bless you all. Bless you, my brother. God bless. 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 God bless.